it's interesting. I, there's a whole bunch of stuff written here which I can barely read. But <laughs> I'll tell you a few personal things first. Uh, I met John, I guess, the first time about two years ago, maybe a little longer at, at meetings. We mm -hmm. both attend very uh, every year to the American Medical and Mathematics Association. And uh, John is the uh, chair of the education committee for the uh, American Medical Informatics Association. I've been really pleased. Uh, I was invited to, to join that committee and been working with John as an incredible leader is able to work with people. You never feel like you're working for him. You feel like he's working for you, I think, most of the time. And I came to, uh, to know him and love him in that period of time. Uh, just a side thing, we're sitting talking one evening, we had some quiet time at a restaurant, and I was talking about some of my interests, in, uh, particularly in liturgical music, and it turns out that this guy, besides his work in data mining, uh, knows everything there is to know, it seems, about uh, great, great <laughs> chants and, and liturgical music, and sings. So uh, I'm hoping at least part of this presentation will be... Oh no, oh no, oh no. <laughs> I don't do solos, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so he does, the area he works in is uh, the whole problem of education in health informatics, which is different from the state of mind work, and uh, he's been working on developing a, uh, a picture of the competencies required in health informatics, bringing together people from all over the United States and Canada, and what's interesting is they're all working together, and I think that's kind of unique and interesting and valuable. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping at this coming meeting in November that there's going to be a a real uh, reception, a good reception of this work, and it's really a landmark where we're finally beginning to put together what you need to know for this field. Uh, John's a uh, assistant professor of medical informatics and epidemiology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, my former hometown, and uh, so we've exchanged a lot of fun things at lunch today, including, as anyone was interesting asked later, a game called Buck Buck. <laughs> 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 Uh, he's also associate director of the postdoctoral fellowship program. He obtained his PhD in information science from Drexel. Why is the case to Drexel and the Science Council? And kind of interesting. They also produced us, uh, some other things as well besides meetings of young kids. His dissertation was evolution-assisted discovery of sentinel features in epidemiologic surveillance. Uh, I was very interested to know that. I was not aware he had done that work in, in his degree. And uh, he's uh, applying evolutionary computation in epidemiological research. So really quite a, an interesting background. Today, John's going to talk about mining health-related uh, data, methods and applications in research, public health, and patient care. And besides informing that, he's promised to keep his interest at the entire time. John, <laughs> Thank you very much, Dominic. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me see if I can do this right. There we go. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, I have to warn you, I have a lot of slides, uh, and we have a fairly short time in which to talk. So um, um, there are times when I'm going to sort of skirt the issue a little bit, but I'm going to put the slides up anyway, and these, these will be available to everybody um, on the web for, for future reference. So if there, are, uh, if there are no objections on some areas, I might be going a little bit faster than, uh, than you might, uh, might like for the, uh, the presentation. So let's start out here with this. This is a, a picture from an archive, from the Bettman Archive, actually, from a, a group of coal miners coming out of a mine in Pittsburgh in 1930. And they're all smiling. And I imagine it's probably because they're just getting off a shift. And you know, the title implies that I'm going to be talking about data mining, and I am. I'm going to be talking about data mining a lot. And I don't want to push the metaphor just too far. A lot of people have done that in the past. But I think it's worth thinking about this concept of mining as something of, as a very purposive activity, that there is something out there to get, and you have to go looking for it. Um, but you know it's there. It's just a matter of you're not really sure what form it takes. You're not really sure how much is there. Uh, in this case, these guys, of course, were looking for, for uh, coal. Um, probably, I always get this confused, probably bituminous, I think, in that area of the state. Um, but we're looking for knowledge and information, and more on that in just a second. So this isn't a, uh, um, a talk about uh, fishing expeditions or uh, you know, the, the kind of thing where people just sort of put a bunch of univariate statistics together and just sort of see what happens. Um, it's a lot more involved than that, as you'll find out. For those of you who have had experience with, with data mining, some of this, I hope, uh, won't be too, too much review. Uh, but I do feel compelled to go over at least some of the basics of what mining is about. OK, so 
here's a basic roadmap of uh, what I'd like to talk about. First of all, just to make sure everybody's on the same uh, wavelength here, it's the obligatory talk about databases and data warehouses. Where do these data come from that we're going to mine? Um, what is data mining? A lot of people use this term pretty indiscriminately and pretty profligately, actually. And there, I think that there's some pretty solid definitions that we need to go back to look at to make sure that we're uh, talking about the same thing here. And then I'd like to talk a bit about the output of data mining. What kinds of things do you get out of the mining process? And I'd like to structure all of this within the context of the data mining life cycle. So I'll go over some pieces of that, not every th everything that I've got slides on. That's probably the place where I'll do some of the cutting. Um, but there is a, a basic life cycle approach here to data mining, just like there is to just about everything in, in um, IS and IT. And uh, data mining is certainly no exception. And then. I have three specific data mining applications that I'd like to talk about in, in research and public health and patient care uh, that show that data mining uh, actually has something to offer, I think, uh, the, uh, the healthcare industry. Okay, so I'm sure you've all seen this before, this, this information spectrum, where starting over at the left we have something uh, called data, and then you have information, knowledge, and wisdom, and there's a certain degree of ordinality to this from left, reading from left to right. But if I put this number up on the board, you have no idea what this means, right? This could be, you know, kilometers per hour, right? It could be just 160. I mean, what, what does it really mean? There are no units expressed with it. At this point, this is just data, right? How about that? The clinicians in the group will immediately recognize this, will probably recognize this anyway, as a hypertensive blood pressure reading. Right? Or at least you'll see it as a blood pressure. You might not say that it's hypertensive yet. It's information because you have this context now. The context is that you've got a slash between these two numbers, and it shows you that there is some sort of a relationship between the two of them. And based on your past experience, you could take a look at those two numbers and understand it's a blood pressure and it's hypertensive. Okay, systolic and the diastolic are both a little high. We're going to be looking at, um, as we progress through uh, the talk, we're going to be looking at mining data to get knowledge. That's really where we're aiming on this, uh, this continuum here. The first place we have to start, though, is the place where data are kept, and that's databases. So uh, just as a, as a quick and dirty review, um, you know, we consider that databases are a logically coherent collection of data uh, with some inherent meaning. The inherent meaning hasn't been discovered yet necessarily, although it might be in place before you put the database into, into play, before you start putting data into it, before you start actually even designing it. But the data just sort of sit there. Okay, that's why we call them a database. We don't call them a knowledge base. A knowledge base is a completely separate thing. We don't call them an information base either necessarily. Uh, a database is really a good term. They're built and they're populated with data for a specific purpose for an intended group of users. Okay, so think about any database, a clinical database that would be associated, for example, with an electronic patient record, uh, or a database that would be associated with an epidemiologic surveillance effort, as I'm going to show you in, uh, uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, but the thing about databases is they, they surrogate or represent some aspect of the real world, okay, so that they stand for something that's happening out there, outside of the confines of this database. Now, one of the issues when you're looking at databases, especially healthcare related or health related databases, is that you have this problem with potentially quote unquote large data. Uh, it's an old term, it's been around for a while, and uh, it's been particularly popular in the data mining literature as a way to justify why we do data mining. Because the data are just too much, they're too, too much to comprehend, they're too large, they're too big. Oh, well, how do you define this largeness? Well, one way is the number of fields in the database, the number of columns, that is, or for you statisticians, the number of variables. It could also be the number of records, right? The number of observations. If you have a patient level database, for example, how many patient records do you have in this thing? Uh, the complexity of the data model. So how many tables does it take to build this database? And what types of relationships exist between these tables? Uh, and then also breadth of distribution. If this is a distributed database across different sites, you know, so you have a distributed server model, for example, or just a, um, a distributed warehouse model, as I'll get into in a second. These all contribute to the largeness of the data. And it's not just the largeness of the data, it's the largeness of the environment in which the data are kept as well. That's actually the point of the last bullet there. So, as always, the issue is high dimensionality in these kinds of data. And how do you get at um, some of the things that you want to find in these data? You can do some of the traditional uh, types of analytic approaches, which I'll talk about. 
Um, and then, again, there are some other uh, alternatives, which is really the point of this talk. Okay, but ultimately, these large data end up in some sort of a, re a centralized resource. They could end up in a large database sitting on somebody's personal server in their office if they're using a, uh, a let's say, a, a surveillance database that they've created themselves or a research database that they've created for a specific research project. Or on the other hand, they could be sitting on somebody's big, you know, terabyte server somewhere that you can access over the net. So some examples. Uh, the CMS minimum data set um, that's covered uh, or collected on nursing homes. Uh, all the nursing homes in the United States get this, uh, this survey uh, to talk about the number of beds, the number of admissions, the number of, of um, you know, uh, there's all sorts of clinical characteristics about the site, the nursing home site. Um, Medicaid claims databases. Uh, in the states, you know, people who are uh, quote unquote on welfare, um, they're covered by the state Medicaid system uh, for their medical expenses. And every time they make a claim, that is every time they go to see a physician or um, get a prescription filled, that generates a claim that goes into a database and generates lots and lots of data. Uh, federally mandated surveillance systems, again, this is one that I'll talk about as one of the examples. Um, but there are plenty of these things, from injury registries and cancer registries, and in this particular case, the um, um, uh, fatality analysis uh, reporting system. And then uh, proprietary insurance claims data is another one, too. So these data come in all shapes and sizes, um, but still they have this largeness feature to them. So uh, another uh, just sort of a generic approach to this is to put these things, put these data uh, or these data into um, a warehouse. So what is a warehouse? Uh, it could, it, in a general term, it's just a centralized resource for long-term uh, storage. It usually supports the activities of an entire organization, like an enterprise. Um, you have input from distributed databases on a scheduled batch basis. That's usually how it works. So that you might have uh, data coming in from external sites. Uh, going back to this example from the insurance claims data, there's a study I've been working on for about the past, uh, I guess, about six years or so. Uh, that's been funded by State Farm Insurance Company. It's the largest automotive um, and other types of insurance too, but particularly automotive insurance uh, company in, um, in the country, in the United States. And we're collecting claims data from their individual claims uh, representatives in 15 states in the District of Columbia. Those data come into a central warehouse in Bloomington, Illinois, uh, every night, basically between 12 and 2 a.m. And then those data are sent to us to be put into our warehouse that we actually end up using um, for a, uh, a study of childhood injury or injuries occurring to children in car crashes. Uh, the nice thing about data warehouses is they give you something of a platform for decision support. You can apply a decision support layer over these things and uh, come up with, uh, for example, clinical uh, uh, practice guidelines or um, other types of decision support tools. Okay, and of course they provide large-scale temporal data over, over time. So. Here's essentially how a, a warehouse would work. And the State Farm example is a, uh, it follows this pattern. So we have all these little databases out there in the states. Then there's an extraction algorithm that, that pumps the data. Actually, it's actually a pull type of mechanism. So it's not so much of a pump, it's more of a pull. It pulls the data from these databases or these local uh, machines and these claims reps offices. And they get transformed, they get, uh, essentially they get aggregated is what really happens. The data get cleaned and they get put into the data warehouse. And then we at the University of Pennsylvania pull these things off into various and sundry formats. Okay, so we're, we're not really analyzing directly the data that come here. These data have all been processed and stored directly into this data warehouse uh, type of structure. The problem with these types of data is they get us into a hole. We have a large number of raw uh, variables and also derived variables. Uh, variables such as age, for example, that are derived from the date of, in the State Farm case, uh, the date of the crash and the, and the person's date of birth. Um, that's an example of a derived variable. And traditional manual methods for discovering patterns, sorry, uh, in data it can be very difficult to do using the typical statistical techniques of univariate description, bivariate uh, description like cross tabulations and the like. We have a large number of variables in that data set and a large number of cases and it gets very quickly you get overwhelmed. Not only that but you have hypotheses going into looking at these analyses and you can end up biasing yourself. Uh, looking for things which you should be looking for but because they were never in your, your mental model to begin with. Um, and then also if you have perspective data like the State Farm data or any, just about any surveillance data set, uh, you have constantly changing patterns in the data that you want to find 
and some of those are not going to be easy to do using a traditional analysis. Now, I've got, I've got to give you a disclaimer. I'm not setting up uh, traditional statistical analysis as a straw man here. In fact, nothing uh, of the sort. To me, data mining is much more of a tool to assist traditional statistical analysis. It's not meant to replace it. Okay, so that's an important thing to keep in mind as we progress. Okay, so data mining is, um, before we can talk about what data mining is, we really have to talk about this whole concept of knowledge discovery in databases. If you remember that, uh, that information spectrum, you know, we're talking about data and then information and, and then you want to go out to knowledge. That's really where we're ending up. So we're trying to discover that knowledge in, in the, uh, the data. Um, here's a, uh, a pretty well-known uh, definition that comes from a person by the name of uh, uh, Gregory Piotrowski Shapiro. He's one of the biggest um, uh, people in the, in the field of data mining. And you'll notice it's the data-driven identification, using the data to speak to you. Uh, to identify valid, novel, and potentially useful and ultimately meaningful patterns in databases. Uh, as I mentioned, it's typically applied to large-scale enterprise databases. Not always, though. It can also be applied to other types of uh, smaller databases, but still have this largeness to them because they're complex. You might have a small number of, of uh, records, for example, but a very large number of attributes or fields. And we see this all the time, for example, in genomics, where you might have one or two records, but yet you have literally thousands of, of attributes. In, in each record. So, but the point here is that we're focusing on hypothesis generation, not hypothesis testing. Okay? So, that was just to revisit that. And uh, just briefly, this, this comes from um, um, actually Fayad's book, An, An Advances in, in Knowledge Discovery and Data Mining. It's one of the first books uh, on the subject. Uh, it's an oldie, more or less, but a goodie, and it's well, worth considering just for a brief minute. The way you would walk into the KDD process is to start with a domain model. So you might ask a very general, very vague question, clinically perhaps, it might have clinical significance. For example, what, what is involved in kids getting head injuries and car crashes? What could be involved with that? If you ask a question like that of a typical statistician, a classical statistician, uh, you'd probably get laughed out of his or her office. You've got to have something more than that. You've got to have a hypothesis. Um, it, what we're talking about here is actually generating hypotheses that are associated with this domain model. You see, so that's, that's a major difference here. And you've got four primary processes that go into this. Um, the first is data cleaning, and then you develop the model, you analyze the data, and then you output um, whatever it is you've gotten from the analysis. So, and there are a number of different tools that fit into this, but loosely this fits into the scheme of a life cycle, of a data mining life cycle, not the specific one I'm about to present. But it's very similar to this. You start with data preparation, then you move into model selection and development, and then you, analysis. You're actually running the models, the data mining models, and then you take a look at the output. And there are a variety of different tools that go into the process. Uh, query tools, even something as simple as just, uh, SQL or extended SQL, uh, structured query language for, for the non-database people in here. Um, a typical traditional tools that you could use for just getting in and just doing queries of the data to see what's in there. You know, like find out how many kids actually had head injuries. And how many kids had head injuries with, you know, uh, with a certain seating position, um, that kind of a thing. Um, and certainly statistics and artificial intelligence tools, which I'll focus on in here. Some visualization tools, which I'll show you a couple examples of, actually historical examples. Um, and presentation tools, data transformation tools, all of these fit into this, this uh, process of, of uh, knowledge discovery in databases. But the main thing to remember is that data mining is actually the application of specialized software tools to the process of knowledge discovery. Uh, I think it's a, a, um, an important message to get across that data mining and knowledge discovery are not synonymous. Knowledge discovery is the activity, I'm sorry, data mining is the activity of discovering knowledge using these specialized tools. Okay, so what types of output do you get? Well, uh, decision tables and trees, association rules, classification rules, prediction rules, look at that. We have three rules, three types of rules here. And rules are a very popular way to express knowledge. And uh, it, it goes way back, um, all the way back to Newell and Simon in the, in the 50s, um, you know, who, who pretty much based the whole, the whole early theories of cognition on, on, um, on rule structures. And it still exists today within this, this uh, data mining context. But then there's some additional ones too, like clusters and visualization. And I'd like to sort of scoot through these a little bit, because um, I want to leave plenty of time to talk about our examples. But a decision tree is just a, a simple method of, of graphically showing, in fact, they're, they're technically acyclic directed graphs, uh, that show the representations between data attributes. 
It's as simple as that. Uh, the nice thing about them is they're very easy to use for data visualization. You can actually see what's going on. So here's a simple decision tree. Uh, this is a decision tree of the CDC rules, the Centers for Disease Control rules for treating a patient for rabies as they present to the emergency room given their history. So if the patient was bitten, then you go through it down this part of the tree. If the patient wasn't bitten, then you don't even treat to begin with. But other questions you might ask if they were bitten were, are rabies present in the area? Or was the animal captured? Was the animal vaccinated? And these terminal nodes here uh, will tell you whether or not you give the patient uh, the, the rabies treatment. Uh, rules, we're talking about uh, traditional if-then rules, sometimes called condition action rules, where you have some, some condition on the left-hand side, that's the LHS, we sometimes call that an antecedent, and then some result takes place, or some classification might take place, that's the right-hand side. And of course you can add all sorts of conditions together uh, in various ways by using Boolean connectors like and, not, and or, very much like you would do for doing a, um, a literature review or a literature search. So that's general rules. Now we're getting into more specific rules that come out of the data mining enterprise. And association rules are very important ones to start with. These focus on the relationships between any attributes. Often when we think of rules, we think of, well, if you smoke, then you'll get cancer. But you know, that's, we're looking at an exposure in traditional epidemiologic terms. We're looking at an exposure, and we're looking at an outcome. Smoking is the exposure, and cancer is the outcome. In association rules, that distinction doesn't always maintain. It's, uh, anything is up for grabs to be on either the right or the left-hand side of the rule. So here's an example one, and actually this comes from um, the, um, uh, the State Farm data set that I was talking about. It's a very silly rule, but actually it was a very important rule. It came up a lot, and it was identified as being very important. Uh, if car make is equal to Ford, then seatbelts worn is equal to yes. Okay, so if you're in a Ford, then you wear seatbelts. <laughs> that, that's totally meaningless. But, however, association rules are very good for finding things like interactions. So, um, and that's always been a very difficult thing to see in, um, in, in doing traditional statistical analyses. When you, you know, you can always find out the relationship between two variables with a simple, you know, two by two uh, type of table. Uh, but to get anything more deep than that, to look for interactions, you really need to get into what's called an n-way table, where you might have a two by two by two table. And uh, it gets to be very complicated looking at that kind of output. So association rules are one way around that to, uh, to assist with that kind of thing. <coughs> Classification rules, on the other hand, now we're talking about the relationship between, let's say, an exposure and an outcome. Okay? The idea here is that the right-hand side of the rule is some sort of a class. Okay? So a class could be dead or alive, it could be disease, in this case it's dead or alive, fatality. Um, you know, lung cancer, if, if smoking equals yes, then lung cancer equals yes, that kind of a thing. That's a classification rule. Classification rules can be taken to the next step in order to predict who will get an outcome based on the input pattern on the left-hand side of the rule. Okay, so a prediction rule is actually a, a, a specialized type of, of prediction or of a classification rule, specialized only to the extent that it's being used to actually make a prediction. Okay, and there are a number of evaluation procedures that we would use to see how well it works. Uh, they may indicate the probability of class membership. It might not be just if you smoke, you get cancer, but if you smoke, you get cancer, and there's a probability associated with that. So a probability of an outcome associated with exposure. And, and here's how they work. Uh, the nice thing about these is they, they come in very handy for implementation in things like clinical guidelines um, or practice guidelines, where if you have a patient who's presenting to you with a certain syndrome, what do you do? Do you decide whether to treat them or not, very much like we did with the rabies example? Or uh, do you let them walk out of the office and, and untreated? Because as far as you're concerned, the likelihood that they are going to have a disease is, um, is, is really very low. Okay, so you have an unknown case, you apply the prediction rule to them, and the case gets classified and with a prediction associated with that as to um, whether or not you should. Okay, so rules are, are the big, they're sort of the grist uh, for a lot of data mining, but there are other techniques that we use. We use clustering as well, um, where you might want to, uh, you have no idea how things are going to coalesce together, perhaps by class, and you want to find out what those classes are. All right, so clustering does this for you automatically. There are lots of different techniques for doing this. You statisticians in the audience, I'm sure, know about things like k-means and hierarchical, hierarchical clustering procedures. Uh, these are available in any uh, statistical analysis package. And the, the, uh, the techniques of clustering are also available in most data mining packages as well.
Okay, so just a, probably a, the picture worth a thousand words algorithm is the best thing to follow here. Let's say we just have a bunch of raw data here. Each one of these represents a case. And conceptually, we don't know this yet, but the pink ones are different than the yellow ones. Okay, it would find that difference on the basis of, oops, sorry. Hmm. It would find this difference based on, that didn't animate correctly, but all the pink ones were supposed to go over here and all the yellow ones were supposed to go over there. Uh, <laughs> and anybody who's done statistical analysis or, or you know, run these things as a statistician can sympathize with this because it's not always perfect. Cluster analysis is actually very difficult to do. Uh, one of the things you have to worry about is this thing called the distance measure. Um, which determines how far away from the center or the centroid of each cluster you're willing to accept cases that are um, attached to that cluster. And it can be something of an art form. Okay. Um, another method which has been around for a long time, since actually the late 60s, is something called online analytical processing, or OLAP for short. This was actually the great granddaddy of data mining. Um, and all the tools that I've showed you before are not restricted only to data mining. Association rules, yeah, but the other things, uh, prediction rules and classification rules, you know, we've been doing that in epidemiology for, gosh, you know, 20, 25, 30 years with, you know, logistic regression, for example, um, is a good tool for doing that. But OLAP is something, something different. If this is a way to visualize data. Um, using, you know, summarization or c data consolidation and aggregation. You can rotate the data sort of in a space and actually see what happens as it rotates. Um, it, so it's, it's been around for a long time. There are still some uh, data mining packages which support it more for historical benefit, I think, than anything else. But getting into something a little more sophisticated is something like data visualization, where there are actual graphical techniques for looking at data. And I just wanted to show you, well, there's some basic ones here. Right? We've all probably seen things like bar, ch bar charts and pie charts and line graphs and the like. But how many of you have seen this? Okay, this is Snow's cholera map. And uh, Snow, back in the 19th century, you know, faced with a cholera epidemic in London, um, decided to draw a map of the outbreak. Basically, each one of these dots is a case. And you'll notice that they tend to cluster right around here. Right? And the thing that's right there that seems to be a problem is the fact that there's a water pump there. Okay, cholera is a waterborne disease. And he was able to show graphically sort of the, the, the epidemic distribution, essentially, um, of, of what was going on in, in London at that time. Let me show you another one. A lot of people don't know that Florence Nightingale was actually the first medical inform nursing informatician, sorry, <laughs> health informatician. Uh, Florence Nightingale did a lot of work in terms of things like standardizing the medical record and the like, but not many people know that she was also one of the first data miners. She produced this thing called a Coscombe plot of mortality in the army in the Crimean War over the period April 1854 to March of 1855. The red are the non-battle -battle fatalities and the blue is the battle-related fatalities. And as you can see, it's very easy to visualize where the distribution of deaths is by month. And you'll notice in here that the deaths rise remarkably over the winter months. Okay? People were freezing to death and they were starving. It was what was going on. Notice that the proportion of non-battle to battle deaths is actually, you know, it gets much higher in here than it is over in here, even though the number of battle deaths in here is actually higher. But the proportion of non-battle to battle deaths is actually higher. Um, and that's because the environment was tougher on them than the enemy. Okay, so I just want to introduce briefly the, the data mining life cycle and just to give you a flavor for how this kind of stuff is done. Um, there's data preparation, there's data reduction, uh, data modeling and prediction and evaluation. In data preparation, we try to standardize as much as we possibly can. You can't just sort of go in and apply a data mining algorithm or, or a piece of software like SPSS Clementine or um, Enterprise Miner that comes from SAS. There are a lot of different data mining tools that are available out there. Um, you can't just go ahead and apply it to data and just look at the results and say, ooh, guess what I found? That's not the way it works. It's actually, uh, it, it, the data preparation phase, just like in the standard information systems life cycle, uh, the requirement specification phase and the analysis and the uh, design phases of that life cycle, they're the longest parts, or they comprise a large part of, this, of the life cycle. So too, in this life cycle, does data preparation comprise a very large portion of that. So 
um, certainly standardizing of the coding, you want to make sure that the coding is the same, basically from um, um, attribute to attribute. You don't want to have some yes-no variables coded as zero ones and other ones coded as one zeros, in other words. So that's the kind of standardization I'm talking about. You might want to apply attribute transformations and attribute normalizations. This is often the result of uh, the constraints of the software. Okay, so for example, a lot of neural network software requires you to transform um, uh, variables into a minus one to a plus one scale. Uh, same thing with cluster analysis. That's often the, the, the case there too. Uh, sometimes you have to denormalize databases. If you have a database where you've got a lot of tables in this, re in this uh, relational structure, sometimes you have to bring these all together into one table and you mine that single table. Um, you might also have to discretize. That happens a lot in, uh, in, in certain of the data mining algorithms that can't handle real encoded data but require that the data are chopped up into categories. And then finally you have to figure out what to do about missing data. That's a major issue. Uh, especially in health-related data, especially in my field in, in epidemiologic surveillance where people just refuse to answer questions on, on uh, surveys uh, or data just aren't recorded on the hospital record and the like. Okay, so these are the ones I really want to scoot through. They will be available. They all have examples of exactly what I just talked about here. Um, data reduction, you might, this is another situation where you just can't assume that data mining is an automatic type of procedure. It's really an automated procedure. What goes on with data reduction is that you're trying to get the data into as small yet without, uh, with uh, as lossless a possible um, representation of its original state. Um, the reason why you might do it is because every data mining method has some capacity uh, limit on it. It can only go so far with these things in terms of numbers of variables or numbers of cases or usually an intersection of the two. Um, you want to reduce noise as much as possible. Sometimes there are variables in the data set that don't mean anything, so you want to get rid of the trivia. Uh, you, the noise itself may overwhelm the software. Sometimes you see this, for example, with older decision tree inducers, um, with the earlier versions of, of uh, decision tree software, which are very sensitive to noise, and they tend to seize up and just stop if they encounter too much noise. Um, and the output itself may overwhelm the users. I've seen that happen, for example, in the State Farm study where we had, uh, you know, about 400 variables or so and about 12,000 cases. And the output was just completely overwhelming. Sitting down with uh, several pediatricians to look this stuff over, it was like, where do we start? So the data reduction piece is, is a major part. And that's even after data reduction, by the way. So there are a number of different methods for doing this. Um, you, you can segment the database. You can delete records from the database and just concentrate on a sample. Um, or you can do feature selection. You can decide which features you want to look at. And we do this all the time, you know, when we're building multivariate models. Um, you never just pump in 300 terms into a logistic regression model right off the bat and expect it to work. It won't. You'll never get convergence in a situation like this, um, either because your data set is, you know, has too many observations or too few or because there's interactions, a number of different reasons. So you have to select. Okay, let's scoot there. And then there's data modeling and prediction. And these are the, this is where we're actually um, applying um, some of these types of approaches to data modeling or uh, data mining. And there are two basic families. There's statistical and probabilistic tools. And then there's machine learning and artificial intelligence tools. The last one is the one I want to concentrate more on. So some of the statistical methods are uh, univariate methods, which I've described before, things like frequency distributions. Um, and, and basic univariate statistics, descriptive statistics. Multivariate methods, uh, which might involve, and that includes bivariate methods like cross tabulations, but also involves more sophisticated things like, like uh, um, least squares and, and logistic and other more complicated regression models. Uh, also Bayesian classifiers, which I put in this, this uh, header. Um, it could also, some people see this as a machine learning tool, that's, that's legitimate as well. Uh, statistical classifiers, sometimes people see that as a machine learner too, but I'm putting it under the statistical heading because they truly have a statistical um, uh, architecture to them. Machine learning tools, some of these you might have heard of before. Um, certainly I've mentioned decision tree induction and I'll come back to that in a second. Neural networks, let me knock that one off right away. Um, people have used neural networks for so-called data mining. And it's a difficult tool to use for that purpose because there has been always this, this sense that neural networks are this quote unquote black box. And it's a, it's a prevalent attitude amongst my st uh, statistical colleagues. And I have to agree with them to some extent. Although there's been a lot of work 
um, and trying to get the knowledge out of a constructed neural network. They're still tricky to use, they're difficult to parameterize and to get knowledge back out of. So um, I'd like to leave them off the shelf right now and I'd like to concentrate more on decision tree induction and evolutionary computation. Um, decision tree induction is the idea of taking just raw data and building the kind of decision tree that we saw before on the basis of usually uh, something called an information score um, as, or which is actually an entropy measure. You're trying to reduce as much entropy or noise in the system as you possibly can by splitting nodes at a particular point using a particular variable and its value uh, to do that split. Evolutionary computation uh, requires a little more discussion. Okay, so the decision tree induction, just think of this as a more automated way just to create the type of decision tree that I showed you before. And there is plenty of software out there to do this. All of the, um, in fact, some of it is available for free. Evolutionary computation, on the other hand, is a whole different story. The, the framework here is based on a, 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 a genetics metaphor, and actually I'd like to change that and just jump right down to the last bullet. And it's actually based on a genetics slash Darwinistic metaphor. You have a, um, a string of data which could be seen like as the left-hand side of a, of a uh, condition action rule. That left-hand side could be seen as a chromosome. Each chromosome has exactly the same number of quote-unquote genes in a situation like this, and those genes correspond to features or attributes or fields in the database. The right-hand side maps to a phenotype, okay? That phenotype would be something like an outcome variable. Okay, so that could be like disease, not disease. So this combination of genes on the left-hand side and matched with this phenotype on the right-hand side, this outcome, and the ability to apply genetic operators to that left-hand side in particular, just like it happens in real life, things like crossover, reproduction, mutation, allows us to generally, uh, uh, slowly over time, but I shouldn't say too slowly, because actually it happens pretty quickly. Don't take the word evolutionary too, too um, close to heart here. Um, you will eventually get a representation in the data that is highly general. It's not, it's not memorized from, the, from data which it is learned from. Let's say you've presented it with a data set to learn from. Um, it hasn't memorized those data. It has generalized from those data so that now it can apply in the future to data which are similar to it and still make a good classification or a prediction. Okay, so we can um, use those techniques to, uh, to our benefit, and I'll, I'll talk about those in just a few seconds with these, um, these samples, uh, these three sample data sets. Uh, this I want to go through fairly quickly, too, because I know we're running short on time, but um, I just wanted to let you know that it's more than just mining data sets or, or databases of, uh, you know, just sort of standard epidemiologic surveillance <coughs> data or medical record data uh, or even finance data that there are a number of other types of data that you can look at um, in terms of uh, spatial data, uh, time series, text, web, all of these things are, are fair game for mining. So spatial data might contain topological information like maps would do, but also imaging data as well. And here's an example. Told you I'd show that. Here's the, uh, that's a pretty fat AAA right there. This person's in big trouble. <laughs> um, but, but take a look at, I know the quality isn't great. This is an old, old image. Um, but there's lots of, of margin issues, there's lots of pixelation issues in here in terms of what do you actually mine from this image to look for pertinent information. Why would you mine an image like this? Well, you might not necessarily mine a single image, you might mine a library of images to look for characteristics that are associated with particular outcomes of, a, of a abdominal aortic aneurysm. You know, um, so it, it, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for here. Although it's possible that you could be using those types of techniques for classification and prediction and therefore diagnosis of an image like this, an automated diagnostic type of tool. Uh, time series data happens all the time in epidemiology and there's a the number of variations that we look for. Uh, things like cyclic or, uh, variations and seasonal uh, variations and random variations. And these are issues that you have to deal with in mining these types of data. And the way, the state of the art at this point right now is pretty much in using um, sophisticated alterations to existing uh, time series uh, analyses. Things like Box Jenkins plots and things of that nature, uh, ARIMA models and the like. Uh, text mining, this is like a hot area, especially in the world of electronic medical records, especially where you've got free text. Somebody enters in into an electronic record a, uh, you know, a progress note or a consult note, 
And there are data which are extremely unstructured in a situation like this. You know, how do you get the data back out? And for those of us who do clinical research on databases like this, you need to be able to mine them. You can't just, you can sort of go in and, and send your, um, um, you know, your research assistant in to go in and abstract the charts. But that's, I can tell you, you know, 30 or 40 years of experience in doing that kind of thing has shown us that that's not necessarily the best way to get data. Uh, or the best way to Im Im actually get knowledge. So there are several different methods for getting in there, looking at keywords and similarity retrieval and this thing called latent semantic indexing, which is a, 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 an important component of uh, text mining right now. It's a big, uh, has been for some time. Okay, and web mining. Of course, this is critical with lots and lots of websites coming up that are related to healthcare. Uh, but as you all know, there are tons of them, and many of these sites are gigantic. They're huge. Take a look at WebMD. Uh, it's highly complex. It has lots of pages. It has a very complex page structure, linking structure, and the like. It's very dynamic. The content changes from day to day. Uh, it has a very broad coverage. And also, there's lots of chat. So some of the things that you might want to do to identify web usage patterns of possibly for ways to improve um, uh, the use of these sites or also for actually for research. What the heck? These things actually have lots of data. Uh, but the problem is they have confusing patterns, and if you can work your way through them, there's lots of applications for this in terms of marketing, future website design to improve on the website design, or for just doing research to find out what kinds of resources are out there for people on the web. Okay, evaluation of these things, of, of the output. When you're actually looking at data mining output, and I'll show you some examples of this in just a few seconds. Um, there are several ways to look at this. One way, of course, is just the basic heuristic, is does this make good clinical sense? You know, so it's not a good thing to have just a, a data miner, somebody who is perhaps, you know, um, a, a person in IT or computer science who knows a lot about the different data mining algorithms to look at the output and make inferences from that. That's not how it works. The, how it works is to help interact, and through interacting with, with uh, domain experts to really get the, um, the clinical questions answered. Um, certainly, multi-method comparisons, <clears throat> you would never, in my book, some people do this, but I don't approve of this and I don't agree with it, um, you don't just settle on a single method for mining your data. Use as many as you possibly can as they are appropriate to the data. And of course, there are statistical methods to do comparisons between these. So certainly things like tests of association, your typical chi-square, t-test, things like that, um, if, as they're appropriate for these uh, particular methods that you're using. Um, and of course, sensitivity and specificity and the predictive values and receiver operating characteristic curves and their associated areas. All of these are typically used in diagnostic tests and they're easily applied to the output of data mining as a diagnostic test in and of itself. Okay, so a couple applications. The first one, oops, they were supposed to come up one at a time. Oh well. Um, Epidemiologic surveillance. I want to look at some motor vehicle associated fatalities, and this comes from the fatality analysis uh, system that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then we're going to look at some issues involved with uh, patient safety, especially with medication errors um, in patients who have been hospitalized in a, using a very large um, hospital admission, actually discharge uh, database um, that's run by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And then finally, uh, the, the use of data mining in assisting with the research enterprise in what we call intelligent data analysis. Okay, the FARS is a prospective uh, surveillance database of all fatal vehicle accidents occurring in the U.S. So uh, there are about um, uh, approximately 45 or so thousand deaths associated with uh, vehicular accidents. Vehicles meaning everything from trucks to cars to motorcycles to bicycles. All of that's fair game in this uh, database. Uh, however, the data on people who were also involved in the accident, although they might still be living, are also included in here. So we're going to be looking at person level data, of which there are about a hundred and some odd thousand records. Um, and altogether, you have a choice of, uh, from about 250 or so variables. Uh, if you're interested, here's the website. It's off and down. It takes you to, unfortunately, it takes you to an FTP site that you can download the data sets for analysis. They come out once a year. They're free of charge, uh, unless you want them on CD and it's a nominal cost. Okay, so the data model, as I mentioned, is you have, you have a crash. Each crash can involve multiple vehicles, and each vehicle has at least one person associated with it. So going back to that original uh, schematic that I showed you about data uh, mining and the knowledge discovery process, 
Let's think about our domain model here. These are some questions that might go into that model, either one at a time or all together. So what variables are associated with fatality? That's a reasonable question. What variables actually predict fatality? That's a different question. And why not just use logistic regression to do this? And how to go about mining this database? Those are, those are some possible questions about this. The first two in particular are associated with or are, per, are very pertinent to the idea of a model. So here's some characteristics. It's denormalized. As we mentioned, the person file contains all these data on every person involved. And it also links back to the crash files and the vehicle files. So we can get vehicle characteristics, vehicle characteristics like the make and the model and the year of the car or the whatever, whatever, whatever vehicle it is. Um, and then the actual crash, circumstances of the crash. Like, for example, uh, what was the environmental condition? Like, was there ice on the road? You know, was there a stop sign at the corner where this intersection, at this intersection where the accident occurred? Those kinds of things. It's large, 101,000 person records with 72 candidate variables in this particular case. There are a total of about 250 in the entire set with the person, the file, or person crash and the vehicle uh, tables included. Uh, there's lots of many uh, missing values. Uh, bicycles don't have airbags after all, but airbags, are, the, the airbag variable is associated with every record, so there will be plenty of missing data. Um, some variables are continuous and that requires discretization for certain DM tools, data mining tools. Um, there can be interactions, passenger airbag deployment versus the year of the vehicle. Passenger airbags weren't required on US vehicles until 98, so this is a big problem here. You're going to see on earlier data um, that there might be injuries due to passenger airbag deployment, or on later data, I'm sorry, where you didn't see them before. So that if you're looking at this in a temporal point of view, that's going to be a problem. Um, and it's very prospective. Even within a given year, new patterns emerge over time. So, for example, the big deal with the Ford Explorer and the uh, Firestone tires, that didn't happen on January 1st. That happened over a period of time within the middle of the year back in, what, 99, 2000. And um, you start to see things like rollovers occurring in the Ford Explorer without a side impact, which is what typically caused the rollovers in Ford Explorers. Because Ford Explorers at that time were notably top-heavy. If they had a side impact, a car or a truck hit them from the side, they would roll over. But now all of a sudden, we're starting to see all these Ford Explorers rolling over on their own. And what was the reason for that? Okay, so that's an example, by the way, of going into the data set and saying, you know, I've got this hypothesis that side impacts of Explorers cause rollovers but yet not finding them. And you're not going to find them because you came into it with the wrong hypothesis or a biased hypothesis. It's not really wrong, it's just biased. Better yet to just look at this and see what you've got. So what we're left with here is a series of, uh, of candidate predictors after applying some of the data reduction uh, mechanisms or, or algorithms that we talked about or I showed you very briefly before. Uh, these are the candidate predictors and the outcome, of course, is fatality, yes or no. Oops. So here's a sample decision tree in the type of, typical type of output that you get from these programs. It doesn't draw you a pretty tree like I showed you with the rabies example. Um, it usually gives you something like this. So, and it would read very much like a rule. If the ejection is yes, if a person was ejected from the car or a vehicle and the person did not make it to the hospital, then it was a fatality. And this occurred, th this happened in 2,968 cases where fatality was predicted and an additional 36 cases where fatality was no. You see, so, and the reason for this, by the way, if you had some clinical sense and you're thinking to yourself, well, why would that happen? Well, the reason in this case is because they were killed at the scene and they didn't make it to the hospital. You see, so that's the kind of thing I wanted to point out with the, the issue of having some domain um, experience and thinking about this. And another thing came up during the course of the State Farm uh, study, which is, of course, a different data set. We found all these kids having head injuries and one of the things that was associated with it almost you know, I wouldn't say uniformly, but very frequently was a side impact. And the reason for that is because kids, especially kids who are restrained in child safety seats, sit ordinarily next to a window because it's easier to put them in. You're not going to bend all the way over to put a kid in the middle of the seat. You put them next to the window. And what happens is you get a side impact and the child's head slams back into the window as a result in force. Or not the window, but the, you know, the side window here. So, um, and then that was actually the thing that was most associated with head injuries in kids. So, it wasn't something that we had actually thought about. So, some example rules, um, you know, if the driver, if you're not the driver, if the person was not the driver and they weren't ejected and there was no drinking or drugs involved, then there wasn't a fatality for that person. Um, if they made it to the hospital, then they were less likely to be a fatality. 
um, if they were not a pedestrian, then they weren't likely to be a fatality either. However, if they were thrown from the vehicle and they didn't make it to the hospital, that was a very strong predictor. It was a fatality. If this was a driver and it was on a rural road and there was no restraint, then it was, then it was a fatality. And our situation here is we went back in and looked at the data and actually found that uh, rather than just relying on what came out of the decision rules, we actually looked at the data and found that, oh, you know what? This person was driving at a high rate of speed, much higher than you would on an urban road. You know? So again, the decision rule doesn't tell you everything, but it sort of points you in certain directions. Um, if it's a work injury, then it's a fatality. And we're still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> That's a tough one. OK, so patient safety. This one is um, looking at the nationwide inpatient sample, the NIS, uh, sometimes called the HICCUP uh, data set, the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Process or Project, that's the HICCUP part, of ARC, the U.S. Agency for Health Research and Quality. Uh, there are 7 million hospital discharges in 97. We looked at 97 data for this case uh, or this project here. And uh, there are data from 22 states. They're sampled from 22 states. And what I'm about to show you um, are they have not been uh, weighted according to this, even though it's a weighted sample. So what I'm showing you is a very raw result, but it's still intriguing nonetheless. And, and looking at this weighted would actually point to, um, I think, a, a very similar pattern. In fact, our preliminary results are showing that. So we have a bunch of predictor variables, uh, both in the demographic categories and then in the discharge diagnoses. And these were just created. This is part of the data um, preparation piece. The hiccup data set has a patient record, and then they've got all these other records. There's 7 million of those. For each one for each discharge, right? And they're not unique for patient. They're unique for patient discharge combination. But we didn't worry about that. Our unit of analysis was, was the uh, discharge. But over in other files, we have about 35 million discharge diagnosis records, one record per ICD code. So we use that file to create these discharge diagnosis indicators. So it's cancer, yes, no, circulation associated illness, yes, no, etc. And using that information. Um, we were able to come up with the, um, our rules that I'll show you in just a second. The, uh, the class distribution is extremely uh, awkward here. And for you computer scientists, you know that this is a, this is a difficult problem and one that requires uh, some techniques and statistics. We think of them as bootstrapping. In machine learning, we think of them as boosting um, to try to, to get a much more accurate depiction of, of uh, what's going on here. But the fact is, is that the no errors overwhelm the medication errors very, very much when you're trying to build a good a classification or prediction rule base. Here's the classification variable. It's the presence of any diagnosis suggesting a medication error, um, defined as your incorrect dosage, incorrect route of administration, the incorrect drug, uh, incorrect time or frequency, any problem associated with medication administration that could lead to an adverse drug event or an adverse, drug, adverse event in the general sense. So that would include things like needle breaks. You know, if the needle breaks off at the hub or something like this, um, that would be a, um, an adverse event. Okay, so we had a pretty open-ended approach here. We used three different data mining techniques. The decision tree inducer we used was something called C5. It is a uh, commercially available product. It's a very good one. Um, its predecessor, C4.5, is freely available. You can lo download it from the web and compile it and, and use it. Uh, in fact, even the source code is available. Um, and then there's a, t a method that I built called EpiCS. Uh, Actually, it's EpiXCS, sorry, um, which is the next generation of this. Uh, which uses evolutionary computation, that Darwinian approach to build rule bases that can be used for prediction and classification. And then for comparison's sake, logistic regression. So some sample negative rules. These are actually sort of interesting. Some of them are. Um, if you have a young person, age less than or equal to 22, and the length of hospital stay is less than two days, or less than or equal to two days, and they're relatively well off, then there's no medication error. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> If they have a moderate length of stay, you know, between two and six days, right, and their income is okay, not bad, you know, it's middle, middle, lower middle class maybe, and they have a dermatologic diagnosis, they don't have an error. The thing that's sort of interesting about the rules like this, though, are why would somebody have a dermatologic diagnosis and be in the hospital for, th for three to six days? You know, so you have to wonder about what dermatologic condition would do that besides something like potentially really serious, you know, something like maybe... I don't know, maybe necrotizing fasciitis or something, which then, then that, and that would be very difficult to understand why there wasn't a medication error because people like that are, tend to get a lot of treatment. But in any event, um, somebody who is middle-aged has a, a five-day length of stay, they have a private insurer. 
uh, and they don't have a gastrointestinal diagnosis, and we're not really sure why that happened, um, but no error was present here. But here's some positive ones. You're going to see that psychiatric diagnoses come up a lot, so regardless of the length of stay. So in this particular case, this was a strong rule. A two-day length of stay, a psychiatric diagnosis, and they had an error. Bless you. Here's another one. They had a length of stay, of, and a really long length of stay, but they're a Medicaid patient, they're on welfare, okay? So, um, and, and they don't have enough obstetric diagnosis. Then there was, a, there was a, 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 a chance for error. I'm not showing you the confidence factors here, but these were all very high. These were all like 0.95 and above in terms of the accuracy of the rule. Um, if they were transferred to another hospital, this makes sense. If they were transferred to another hospital, they had a very short length of stay, and this, is, this actually makes a lot of sense right here. The relationship between those two conjuncts, the, the transfer and the and length of stay is equal to one. So that's good. <laughs> um, but they also have a psychiatric diagnosis, and this is sort of interesting. Why are all these psychiatric people coming up with, with uh, medication errors? We're not really sure. Some people would say, oh, well, that makes a whole lot of sense, actually. Hmm? It could be. It could be. It could be also that they're on just lots and lots of meds. You know, I mean, if you're on a, um, you know, if some drugs cause, uh, you know, some of your major um, antipsychotics cause tardive dyskinesia, for which you give, you know, like a drug to counteract that, and, you know, it's, you know, there, there's a, it's, it's a complex drug picture for a, a lot of these people. So we're thinking that that's probably the case. Okay, for, so the last one. Going back to FARS again, looking at the FARS 2001 person file this time, not the 97 data. And we use two data mining methods here, FEXCS again and then C5 again, and logistic regression. These, these happen to be two of my favorite methods, but there are others. Um, these are not data which, for which clustering is probably the most appropriate, but that's okay. You could use it. Um, the problem is, is that the data, large, data set is too large to analyze via traditional methods, right? So we, have, we know we have more than 100,000 cases and we've got greater than 100 variables right now before we do any variable selection. So if we were doing variable selection via logistic regression, see we're going, going back to the entire, uh, this is the, the person data set, but this is now for 2001, so it's a different data, um, different data set and we have more variables. That's why it's a little different if you're catching that. Um, we can't use the traditional bivariate methods that we use to select variables for logistic regression. That's typically the way we do it. But we just, it's going to be just way too cumbersome to do that, especially to look for interactions. So how can we build a, a robust logistic model using these data? Well, one thing we could do is to bootstrap, and that's certainly a legitimate way to do this, is to run a, a logistic models over and over again with small samples of the data, randomly drawn from the data set. Um, and that can be done. It takes a long time. Bootstrapping on even really fast machines uh, on a data set like this uh, to, you know, like if you're bootstrapping maybe out to about a thousand iterations, and depending on how large you make your, your training set, um, it can take as long as two or three days. So that's pretty cumbersome to do. Um, on the other hand, you could mine the data to identify candidate predictors and interactions, but there could be problems with that as well. Mining's not perfect. It's definitely not a panacea. Or you could do both. So we did both. And here's what we found. These are the, um, the, the X's here are significant predictors. These are things that would have been, should be put into a logistic regression. But in reality, if you just ran a bootstrap to logistic regression, some of these items weren't found. And some of that is pretty critical. Things like vehicle rollover or this whole issue about not being hospitalized. Logistic regression didn't pick that up on its own. Um, pickup trucks, that's a big one. Pickup trucks are actually, excuse me, a, a major source of, uh, of fatalities in this population, primarily because they're not engineered to be uh, you know, family type vehicles. And they're not particularly safe for children even the ones with, uh, with extended cabs in the back, because they're not padded correctly, the seats face the wrong direction on some models. Um, they're just not ideal. Um, but the logistic regression didn't pick that up either. Elderly patients, rear-end impacts, and inappropriate restraints, none of these were picked up by the logistic regression. Some of these were also not picked up by C5, the decision tree inducer. But, and I'm not showing you the, the interactions here, because there were some interactions that were associated with these, particularly rear-end impact and inappropriate restraint. They interacted they were actually an important interaction. I'm just not showing it to you. And that makes sense because especially in kids, I wasn't focusing only on kids, I was looking at all people in this, in this uh, data set. 
Um, people who are not restrained appropriately, not wearing seat belts or shoulder belts um, appropriately, and they get hit from the rear, tend to get slammed because of the resultant force, either into the seat in front of them or into the dashboard. You see, and worse um, yet is there was another one that also came up. It's not shown here. Is front end impact, an impact at 12 o'clock, right directly into the car, head on, um, and inappropriate restraint because we know that the airbag will go off, and if you're not wearing a seatbelt and you're exposed to an airbag, you're in big trouble. That's that could be that's the cause of most of these uh, of these airbag injuries and even fatalities. Okay, so and in terms of classification, the rules that were actually found. Um, actually worked pretty darn well across all of these methods, but EPI-XCS, this method that, uh, that I've talked about, this, this evolutionary computation method, and the other data mining method uh, worked very well in terms of positive predictive value, in terms of being able to predict that, uh, or being able to say that once you have a decision that a case should be classified as positive, that that case is, is in fact a positive. Uh, that's what I mean by positive predictive value. Uh, both of these did reasonably well on a scale of 0 to 1. Okay, and the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve is, is also pretty decent too between EPI-XCS and logistic regression, even though the variables weren't all picked up on the logistic regression, which is sort of an interesting phenomenon. Okay, so in conclusion, and we'll have some time for some questions after this, um, the kinds of things that, that data mining can answer um, are, you know, like, are there attributes that seem to be associated with others? So this whole variable selection question that we just looked at in this last example. Um, are there any attributes that may be associated with an outcome that you're not considering because you've got some sort of a bias? You have a conceptual bias going into the analysis. You're walking into this data set and you're saying, oh, I know kids, when they're involved in a car crash, you know, they're going to have head injuries because their heads slam into the seat in front of them. Well, as a matter of fact, that's not what causes most of them. That causes a lot of face, injur face injuries, but it doesn't cause things like concussions and, and diffuse axonal um, injury. So the kinds of things you really get concerned about, right? Facial injuries, cuts, things like that, that's relatively minor, as long as the cuts themselves are relatively minor in a kid. But um, other things like concussions are serious issues, and they have to be, have to be thought out carefully. And, and it's not slamming into the seat in front of you that causes that kind of thing ordinarily. Um, or what variables should be included in a regression model. So how can data mining help you with the statistical analysis? These, these tools, unless you're using a statistical tool, and I wouldn't use a statistical tool for data mining and expect to get a significance out of it. I wouldn't even look at the p-value. And in fact, generally when I use it for, when I use data mining or statistical methods for data mining, I suppress the p-values or the confidence intervals because I don't want to know. What I want to know is just looking at frequencies and distributions, getting a general idea of how things look in terms of maybe percentages and cell percents and things like that. That's the kind of thing you look at when you apply those tools. But looking at p-values at this level is not a good thing. And also other tools just don't give them to you. So like C5, for example, or EPI-XCS or, or cluster analysis, um, if you suppress the cluster, uh, or the p-values, you won't get that. It's just not there. And then you can't always rely on what the miner is telling you. You have to be careful with this. You have to use a, a suite of tools and a, a, a lot of approaches. Um, so if you've got large data, it's appropriate. Even small data, it's appropriate. Things like specialized registries and ad hoc clinical research databases, which might be small in terms of number of records, but they're still darn complicated because of, of uh, interactions between variables. Okay, so that when the data are complex enough that you're just not sure that looking at them, just looking at them and getting a sense of, um, of where things are with these preliminary stabs at the data are going to give you the answers that you need. That's a good place to try, try to think about this. So I, t I say that data mining is a computer science discipline. Uh, the, the tools of data mining or the tools of knowledge discovery are very much in the domain of computer science. No question about that. Um, but actually, the process of knowledge discovery isn't just a computer science discipline. It's also a clinical discipline. It can be a social science discipline. There's a, 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 maybe an economics discipline, for example. There are lots of places where people from all different kinds of disciplines fit into the process, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, there's lots of new techniques and software that constantly appear, and people make sort of broad sweeping claims that these things are the panacea, um, but many of them have been untested. And you see this a lot at you know, the, the, um, the uh, knowledge discovery meetings every year. And a lot of these things are very, very interested and interesting, but they can't just sort of be grabbed and, and plugged in. You have to be, um, be, be very circumspect about the whole thing. Okay, so I'd like to just close with some ethical concerns because these are important. Data mining can't be used to make policy at least by itself. 
If you are a, um, a hospital administrator, for example, and mining financial data and trying to judge how practice patterns should be um, adjusted or affected in some way um, based on just going into mining your financial data or mining your practice data or process data for that practice, um, that's probably not a good way to do it. Okay, it might help to inform the policy making decisions, but uh, data mining in and of itself is not used for that. It's used to help to sort of round out uh, your, your conception of the knowledge and information that's in the database. Um, the results probably shouldn't be reported in the literature unless it's a data mining article. And I say that from personal experience. <laughs> Um, if you're submitting an article to, to um, you know, American Journal of Epidemiology or the like, it's okay to say that, you know, you mine the data, but to get into, like, the details, uh, for you academics among you, you might want to think about that. If you go ahead and use data mining, you might mention it, but don't go into the hardcore details about how you did the data mining. Um, it's probably not relevant, and the reviewers probably won't understand it anyway. But the point is, too, is that the results don't in and of themselves make reportable results. They are information that leads to the discovery of knowledge. Okay, that's a really important thing to get across here. So they're not the end, of, the end in and of themselves for the entire analysis. Uh, and then finally, there's no substitute for the intellectual enterprise of which data mining is just a small part. Okay, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, I'll put some resources up here. Thank you.